So what is a state machine and how can we code one in hardware using Verilog? Now, state machines are incredibly useful tools because they provide an elegant way to solve many complicated programming problems. Now, I'll be using the example of a pair detector state machine, but you should be able to apply the same process for any state machine you need. So in our case, what we need is a state machine which can detect a sequence of two ones or two zeros in a random input stream. So when it detects those two ones or two zeros, it should output a one to say, I've detected a pair. So how can we design a state machine to perform this simple task? Well, let's start with the basic definition of a state machine. So a finite state machine has a finite number of defined states, and it has an input which triggers a transition between these states, and it also has an output from the machine. And our starting point is normally the state transition diagram. You can see here that we can design these little bubbles which represent a state. Uh, now within these bubbles, we have a couple of numbers. The first number represents the state uh, number, how we encode the state, and the second number represents the output associated with, with that state for, uh, in this case, a more machine and we can jump between states depending on what the input is. So that's how a state machine works. So back to our pair detector. Now there's many different ways that you can encode and design a state machine to fit any particular problem. But in this case, I'm going to use four states to model my pair detector. The first state is going to be called 00. zero and that's gonna be the start state. Uh, now the next state is the one in which we have received a sequence of one, one. And then from that point, we can then say, if we get a one, it's gonna detect a pair. If we get a zero, we'll go to the state in which we have currently a single zero. And each state we're in, we have to decide what the next step is going to be. So the initial design of the state machine is going through each state, looking at what the possible inputs are, and then determining which state you should go to next. Now, before we move on to the design of the Verilog hardware, let's take a look at what happens for an arbitrary input to our state machine. And remember, the input is assumed to be a random sequence of ones and zeros, and the state machine should be able to detect a pair of two ones or two zeros. So pay close attention now to what happens for an arbitrary input of bits. Uh, now in this animation, we can see that the, the state which is blue is the current state. And depending on what the inputs are and which state we're currently in, the current state will move to a different state for each new input. And then hopefully for any possible input condition, we should be able to find a pair of ones or a pair of zeros. So now we understand what state machines are and how they work. How do you actually code a state machine in hardware in Verilog? Let's take a look. So the starting point is our four states. And first thing we do is we have to have a register to store the two bits which represent and encode the state that we're in. Now two bits make sense because we have four states. We need two bits to encode a unique number to each of the four states. So that's the first bit. Now, the next thing we do is we have a case statement and we go through each state and we ask the question for a given input, what should the next state be? So in this case, we start off with a state zero, zero. This is the starting state. If the input is one, we go to state zero, one, which represents the state in which we have one, one. Otherwise, it's the only other thing that can happen. If we have an input of zero, we go to the state which represents a string of one zero. That's the first step, that's the first state. And the next thing we do is just go through every possible state. It's a bit boring, it's a, it's a bit tedious, but this is how you do the brute force coding of a state machine. So what about the output logic? Now, so far we've talked about the next state logic, and that means 
you know, what do we do when we're in a particular state and we get a particular input? The question is, what state do we go to next? But another important question is how do we control the output based on what state we're in? And this is where we have to talk about the subtle difference between the Moore machine and the Mealy machine. Now, the example we've just talked about is an example of a Moore machine because the output is only a function of which state we are currently in. But the Mealy machine depends not just of what state you're in, but also the next input. And that means with the Mealy machine, the output can update quicker than in a more machine. Now, the difference is actually quite subtle, and on the face of it, the two machines will do exactly the same thing, but I just thought I'd mention that subtle difference between the two types of machine. Now, let's talk about the output logic. And in the case of a more machine, it's really straightforward because it's just a simple matter of looking at what state we're in and then deciding what the output should be appropriately. So in this case, if we're in state 1-1, one, one, that's actually the only state that would require the output to be 1 because that means we've detected a pair. For all other states, the output should be 0. So that's a really, really easy thing to do with a more machine. So putting all this together, this is what my pair detect module looks like in Quartus. You can see we have here the next state logic, which is just a big case statement, looking to see what we should do when we're in each state for a given input. The input here is called in bits, and that's the random stream of ones and zeros, which we want to find pairs in. And then we have a separate block here, which is the output logic. So this is telling the machine what the output should be based on which state we're in. And remember, this is a more machine. So doing this output logic is really easy. It's just a simple matter of seeing which state we're in and then assigning the output appropriately. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do analysis and elaboration. And I'm going to show you a really nice feature in Quartus, which is kind of hidden. We can actually go to Tools, Netlist Viewer, and we can open the State Machine Viewer. And this actually visualizes the hardware as a State Machine. And this is a really nice way to check whether your State Machine is actually doing what it should be doing. So that's a nice visual check of your State Machine. So you can open this as soon as you've done analysis and elaboration, you can open up this state machine viewer. Now I'm gonna perform analysis and elaboration. And then the next thing I'll do is have a look at my test bench. Now this test bench instantiates the pair detect module that we just saw. And I've also created a random, pseudo random stream of ones and zeros. And I've also, uh, one of the differences between the code I just discussed in the animation and this code is I've got a reset state. Now this doesn't change any of the fundamentals of the code. It just means that if we have a reset go high, it will just put us back into the starting state. That's all. But the rest of the test bench is doing exactly what you would expect. We're generating a clock signal with a period of 20 time periods, 20 time ticks, and we're also generating a stream of random ones and zeros. And I've actually predefined this, these ones and zeros just to make it easier for us to do the analysis. So I'm going to run analysis and elaboration, and then we can check out these simulation results. Okay, so analysis and elaboration has finished. So let's go ahead and open model sim. So let's see what we've got. So I'm just going to get the waveform window up. We can see our waveforms here. The timer indicates that the simulation has started. So I'm gonna just go simulate and break because we don't really want the sim simulation to continue for very long. And I'm gonna go zoom full. And it doesn't really matter where we zoom in here, but we have to pick somewhere to zoom in. And then we start to see some of the detail. Now let's take a look at these results and see if it's doing what it should be doing. So remember, this is a pair detector. So any consecutive pair of zeros or pair of ones, we would expect the detect output to go to one to indicate that it's found a pair. So let's start from this point, zero, one. So it's on the positive edge of the clock, and then another one. And then there's a one clock cycle delay 
and then the detect signal goes high. So that's important for a more machine. A melee machine would go high immediately on that second one, but because this is a more machine, it's synchronous to the clock and we don't go high until the next clock cycle. So I think this is working fine. So I think the next step for me is to try to implement this for real on the FPGA board. So let's see if we have any success with that. Okay, so what I've done is I've made a block out of this pair detect module. So just right click, create symbol file for current file, and then you can insert it into a BDF. So this is my pair detect module. And of course, we have an input which is in bits, and that means random stream of input bits going into this input. Now we also have the clock. This is the 50 megahertz clock, which is on the Cyclone 5 starter kit board. I haven't bothered with a phase lock loop for this uh, simple project. And the reset input, we will just hardwire this to zero. We don't need to do anything fancy with the reset. So the outputs of this should be the detect pin here. So what I've done is I'm using signal tap to, to basically allow me to look at these signals whilst the FPGA is running. And I think it's important to say that this block here is just a shift register to give me a string of bits, which is pseudo random. That's not really very important to the project. I just wanted something that would give me a string of ones and zeros, which was roughly random. It's not the most efficient way of doing it, but um, that's sufficient. So I'm going to compile this design and then we can have a look at the compilation report and the resource usage and then we can go to signal tap and take a look at whether this pair detect state machine is working. Let's compile. So this is the compilation report. So logic utilization, not much, less than 1% of the capacity of this FPGA. Now, what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna to go to tools and I'm gonna open the signal tap logic analyzer. And I've already populated the signal tab here with the signals I want to see. And I'm just gonna program the device from over here. And then once that's programmed, the wonderful thing about signal tap is you can actually see those signals in real time. And there we go. So in bits looks fairly random. So what we need to do is just pause it and then zoom in a bit, I think. In bits is this one and the detect signal is this one. So it's gonna go out one more. So let's see if it's detecting pairs. Now that there are an awful lot of pairs here. So it's probably better to look where there aren't pairs. And where there aren't pairs is when we have 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. And that happens here. So if we look here, we have 1, 0, 1, 0. So detect should be 0 for uh, those. And it is 0. So you can see one clock cycle later, it's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Oops. Which does correspond to what we just saw. Now, when we have pairs, so for example here, we have one, one, so that's a pair. So on the next rising edge of the clock, we will detect a pair, which is here. So this looks like it's doing exactly what we expected to do. So fairly satisfied with the results here. Now, just to avoid any confusion, what happens if we do detect a pair is we actually go back to the state where we're looking for a new pair. So if we get three ones in a row, that would detect the first two as a pair but then the next one would become the first in a pair. It doesn't continue from you know, the middle one in, in that sequence. So that explains what we're seeing here. So and run that again if you want and have a look at this in real time. But um, that's the signal tap results for the pair detect project.